She was totally unaware. The last moments of a young woman's life caught on tape. You get excited because you had a video which showed somebody pulling the body out of the car. Oh God, please don't let this be heard. But does the video tell the whole story? There was this hour and a half in time where we don't know what happened. And what was this man doing that night? I seen her in the back seat. I seen her eyes were open. Police search for answers while a family comes to grips with the truth. Evil crossed Melanie's path that night. Murder caught on tape. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. We live in an age where cameras capture practically everything in our lives. They protect our homes and our shops, our cars and our streets. But they can't always protect us. For the family of 19-year-old Melanie Goodwin, cameras would prove a blessing and a curse. As Jim Avila first reported in 2009, they had played a vital role in Melanie's brief life. Now, they would provide vivid clues to her death. Knock, knock. Who's there? Interrupting cow. <laughs> Interrupting no. No. <laughs> Melanie Goodwin lived nearly all of her 19 years in front of the camera, a born actress in a Shakespearean tragedy, her mother Peggy. When she was a little girl, like two, she'd be making faces in front of the mirror and just entertain herself for hours. So we started her in voice lessons and theater classes when she was about third grade. Growing up in Arlington, Texas, her best friend, Demaya Pridgen, was always there to help her practice. We lived across the street from each other for many, 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 many years. And as kids, we loved to play. We had great imaginations. We would make stuff. We would go, you know, in the backyard and play hide and go seek. I mean, just all kinds of things. Some of my best memories as a childhood, all of my best memories as a childhood were with Mel and her family. She's up for it. All right. I have to oh. Ooh, nice. Was she always an actress? Yes. Always loved to sing and dance and to laugh. <laughs> And her father, Glenn, never missed a performance. What was your favorite? I've got to say it was Cinderella. She was just the most beautiful godmother you could ever imagine. With the crown on and her scepter. And you could just hear the audience gasp, like, whoa. And I'm sitting there thinking, whoa, that's mine. <laughs> And Melanie's fairy tale was not just on stage. She was living one, a communications major at the University of North Texas, where she met boyfriend Ollie Valencia with leading man looks and a heart to match. How would you describe your relationship with her? Almost like a modern day fairy tale in my eyes. We were just two fools in love who were best friends and couldn't get enough of each other. So you thought this may be the woman for you forever? I knew this was the woman for me. Melanie's deeply religious family was close. An older sister and brother who adored her. A star at home, too. Melanie just embraced everything. Uh, she was fun to talk to. She's smart. She had an insight that uh, envisioned that uh, was a little bit, well, was unique. And of course, she was my baby, so the baby's the baby. and. <laughs> And <laughs> she's my girl. <laughs> All backed by a supporting cast of many fast friends. I think that that's what makes this so hard. Just never can imagine something like this happening to such a beautiful person. On Monday afternoon, September 24th, 2007, Melanie's bubbly, always-on personality is in full display at 5 o'clock as she heads off to work as a model promoting the energy drink Red Bull. I kissed her goodbye and just looked her in her eyes and was just so happy to be with her. And she went on with her day. Melanie met the other Red Bull girls for dinner and then reported to a video game store called the GameStop, handing out samples to Red Bull's target audience of young males anxious for the premiere of a new hit game, Halo 3. 
GameStop wasn't releasing it till midnight. And they went to the GameStop to promote the product. And then they finished probably around 1 or 1.30. It's now early Tuesday morning, and Melanie's headed back to campus, her long day finally about to end in the arms of her boyfriend. But first, as is her habit, she checks in with him by phone. I was in bed when she called me, and I was like, yeah, you know, yeah, baby, I'm going to leave the door open, just come up. Ollie had one small request. He will spend the rest of his life wishing he'd never made. I asked her to stop. She was going to bring me home chocolate milk and some Cheetos. And um, I woke up two hours later, and, you know, she wasn't home. And it's at that final stop for snacks in this nearly empty convenience store on a dark and lonely street just a few miles from her boyfriend's apartment where Melanie's last act is played out on camera once again, captured in harsh lighting, and this time on grainy surveillance tape. Carrollton, Texas detective, Greg Frey. You see Melanie walk into the store, and as he's walking by, you can see him looking into the store and watching what she's doing. And probably 30 or 40 seconds later, she comes up to the counter, and she's talking to Ali, saying, I'm on my way home, and you see him walking up behind her. She was totally unaware. A new sinister character is about to enter Melanie Goodwin's life, and it's not a bit part. Evil crossed Melanie's path that night. When we return, Melanie's boyfriend is desperate to reach her. And I called and called and called and called. I was trying to calm myself down, like, you know, everything has to be okay. And another call, this one to the police. There's a burnt female body over here. Stay with us. It was after one in the morning when vibrant college student Melanie Goodwin stopped at a convenience store. She planned to pick up some snacks for her boyfriend and then meet him back at his place. But she never arrived. Hours later, Texas authorities are on the verge of making a gruesome discovery. Once again, here's Jim Avila. <laughs> The morning shift at Transtech Software is arriving early on Tuesday, September 25th, 2007, greeted by the unthinkable. Carrollton 911, address of your emergency. There's a burnt female body over here. A real mystery for police, a sensation for Dallas TV news. Her badly burned body was discovered in a field in Carrollton. The call is a burnt body in a ditch and the body is charred beyond recognition. At 11 a.m., Carrollton, Texas Police Detective Greg Frey is the first investigator on scene. We were afraid that might be a serial killing. Just the way that the body was laid out in the ditch, it almost looked like it was posed with her legs facing the parking lot and knees kind of up. And you can only tell that it's a female uh, by her hair and by the French fingernail tips that she's had done. I've seen my share of terrible things that people do to each other. This one is probably the most terrific that I've seen. But the horror was just beginning because in the first big break of the investigation, someone notices the office building parking lot is videotaped 24 hours a day. Whatever happened to this young woman happened on camera. You get excited because you had a video which showed at early morning hour a vehicle pulling up and somebody pulling the body out of the car, down to the ditch, back up to the car to get something out of the car, back down to where the body was, and you see a horrific the light, which the flame in the body burn. The person comes up, jumps in the car. And... Just that quickly, within an hour of finding the unidentified body, the detectives know how their victim got in such terrible condition. And key to finding her identity, the tape also reveals the type of car used to dispose of her, a red Saturn. I now have a vehicle I can look for. There's an image which looks like a male. I've got a little bit of clothing that I can see from the video. You can see a white shirt, you can see half pants. And now you have hope that we can get 
a running start on something that we had nothing just a few moments ago. While all this drama and mystery is going on there, at the same time in a suburb close by, Melanie Goodwin's boyfriend, Ollie Valencia, is waking up in a panic. Melanie didn't come over as promised during the night. You know, I called and called and called and called. I was trying to calm myself down like, you know, everything has to be okay. She's missing, missing. You must find her. Ollie hopes for an innocent explanation and makes no call to police. So detectives are working their newfound mystery in a vacuum. They had no missing persons report. Nothing that could help them put a name to their badly burned Jane Doe. You go back to who that person could be. The first is the usual suspects like a homeless person, prostitute, uh, someone who's into uh, criminal activity, and, and you try and build it from there. I'm code six at more Island. But then a second break when investigators discover the grunt work of routine patrol. The night Melanie disappeared, a beat cop had noticed something out of place. Officer Otis Q had found a suspicious vehicle not far from the scene. It was a red Saturn parked oddly alone in a corner of an apartment complex. I walked up to it and one of the first things I noticed that really kind of threw a curveball at me was uh, I, I kind of detected the odor of gasoline coming from the inside of the vehicle and there was a gas can sitting on the driver's seat. He didn't know it at the time, but Officer Q's curiosity had developed a huge lead. Authorities now have the license number and description of a red Saturn seen with a gas can in it, a red flag that points Detective Frayd and his colleagues to the owner of the car in the video, and more importantly, to an address. Running the plate, I came back to the Goodwins out of Arlington, so we decided we need to go over there. That's where our suspect was. Because the car is registered to the father. Yes. And in your mindset at this point, you think this may be the bad guy. Correct. We're under the assumption that it is our suspect. So when you knock on the door, what are you prepared for at that point? To start interrogating my suspect. And Mrs. Goodwin answers the door, and I ask her, do you own a red Saturn? She says, yes, I do. It's my daughter's car. And at that moment, in my mind, I knew that I no longer was looking for my suspect, that I had to do 180. I'm now looking at my victim. The body in the parking lot and Melanie Goodwin are now linked. It was a difficult visit. Detective Frayd had prepared himself for an arrest, not a death notification. I'm thinking, okay, she's missing. They found her car, she's missing. Then they ask about a ring she was wearing. And my mind's just working and finally it just clicked. And I said, do you have a body? And Detective Frey just put his head down and said, yes. It's difficult for me to say that it's Melanie because the body is so badly burnt that I couldn't say for sure that that was her. And then they ask if I had a picture of her and I went back to the bedroom and I got a picture and I got on my knees and I said, oh God, please don't let this be her. Don't let something happen to her. It was a surprise gut blow to Melanie's mom. But Peggy Goodwin is a trained software programmer and through her tears on her home PC, she actually gathers herself enough to help police close in on where her daughter may have been last seen alive. I went into this business mode trying to find my daughter and it wasn't that I wasn't feeling anything or scared or upset or collapsing and crying, but I knew I had access to all the information they needed to find Melanie. She called Melanie's boyfriend at college uh, to see when the last time he had spoken to her. You know, I could tell she was worried by the way she was talking to me saying, you know, if I had seen Melanie it was the last time I talked to Melanie, you know, what do I know? Ollie tells Melanie's mom she had not shown up at his house as planned. And at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Detective Frayd sends a fellow investigator to question the young man, who they approach as a possible suspect. Detectives have him take off his shirt to check for signs of a struggle. None. And his alibi that he was with roommates all night checks out. Plus, cell records show he was talking to Melanie by phone until she disappeared. Finally, as police interviewed him, 
he just did not fit the crime. He's the all-American boy, a former wrestler, does well in school, never been in trouble, doesn't have that profile. That helps us in, in clearing him rather quickly. But it takes a while for the stunned Ollie to realize Melanie is not just a missing person, and there was not an innocent explanation, as he had hoped, for her disappearance. I asked the officer, so is there a good chance we're going to find her? And that's when he was like, son, you know, she's passed away. And after that, it just, uh, I was just taken out of this world. It was Ollie who led police to her last stop before disappearing, feeling terrible about his innocent request for a post-midnight snack with his girlfriend. He pointed them to the convenience store where Melanie made her final call. I couldn't even look at her parents in the face because I felt as it was my fault. My fault she's not here today. She wasn't here yesterday. She won't be here tomorrow. No one can predict where good and evil will cross paths, where a simple stop at a convenience store for chocolate milk and Cheetos will turn dangerous, even tragic, a place where innocence is lost, where Melanie Goodwin, in a surprise rendezvous, runs straight into a stone-cold killer. You can see him looking into the store and watching what she's doing. It turns out the state-of-the-art quick trip convenience store has four cameras watching customers, the registers, even a glimpse of the sidewalk out front. And it's those cameras whirling away in the middle of the night that give Detective Frayd the first clue to the identity of Melanie's killer. The first thing that stands out in our mind is a male that is just kind of walking up and down the outside of the store. Nearly every step of this crime is on videotape another break it's not only video but it's video with audio for an hour and a half early that september morning way before melanie stops by for a snack to take home to her boyfriend this man hovers around the counter even convincing the clerk to let him use the phone trying to get his estranged girlfriend other friends anyone to give him a ride and a place to stay Dallas County Prosecutor Andrea Hanley has watched this tape over and over again. He'll hang up the phone, he'll walk around, he'll pace back and forth, just flat out loitering. He's got no money to buy anything. He has no money to buy anything. I think, it, as a matter of fact, the clerk um, gave him a soda and a pastry. You know, because the guy had no money. He had nothing going on. He had, he'd asked the clerk, hey, can I sleep here? And he said, you can't sleep at this store. And by the way, buddy, you might not want to hang around here anymore. He's outside the store when Melanie, dressed in a skirt and top, comes in. She heads right over to the snack aisle for the Cheetos her boyfriend, Ali, had wanted. And then the dairy case for the chocolate milk. The clerk is busy but remembers Melanie had gone back to the restroom. And that's when she meets the loiterer, about her age, but desperate, out of options, and turning to a fellow 19-year-old for help. And he remembers as best he can that, that the defendant was in fact asking her for a ride. And you can very faintly hear it on the videotape. You can hear him say certain things like, my truck broke down, or I would walk but these shoes aren't good, and it's just a quarter of a mile, it's just up to McKinney Avenue. And you hear her saying, she wasn't a naive girl, you know, and she knew that that's, that's not the thing to do. Melanie then walks away, and the vagrant walks out of the store. She then heads for the checkout and gets on her cell phone for the final time to tell Ollie she is on the way home. What were you talking about? She was just telling me how, um, how hot she was looking because she had just tanned. And you told her you'd leave the door open for her? Oh, yes, sir. That came later. Yes, sir. Back at the store, Melanie finishes paying at the counter, walks out the door, and heads to her car, Cheetos and chocolate milk in hand. And that's when you see the defendant loop around. And is there any videotape outside the store? Do you see them? No. That's the mystery. There are certain angles where you can see what looks to be the headlights of her car. 
backing out to leave the store, but we don't know exactly what happened out there. Police quickly discover from phone records at the Quick Trip who the loiterer had been calling on the phone. And within 24 hours of finding the body, they finally had a name to go with the face on the tape. Police issue an arrest warrant for this man, Ernesto Reyes, in the murder of UNT student Melanie Goodwin. A search warrant is issued and police begin looking for their suspect, Ernesto Reyes, already knowing he has no place to hide. He's been kicked out of his house. His longtime girlfriend who stood by him through all his failures and excuse making has finally said, look, I'm fed up with it. You know, I I'm through with you also. With police closing in, Ernesto Reyes flees to Mexico, where he's picked up by U.S. Marshals two weeks later. Everybody was euphoric and called us all excited. You hear they got him, they got him. And we were relieved they got him. But our euphoria was very short lived. We still don't have our baby girl. When we return, Ernesto Reyes tells his side of the story. I asked for a ride, and she said to me, where are you going? And I told her, in my friend's house. And could there be another man involved? I remember she had a skirt on. Who really murdered Melanie Goodwin? Stay with us. The body of college co-ed Melanie Goodwin has been identified, and with several quick breaks, police believe they have apprehended her killer. As they construct the timeline and build the case, they learn more about Melanie, a random victim of a homicide. Once again, Jim Avila. University of North Texas communications major Melanie Goodwin came from a religious family and she wore her faith, if not on her sleeve, on the bumper of her 2002 Red Saturn. There was a decal on the back that had, uh, had Melanie's name and then her license plate bracket, uh, you know, that said, angels are watching over me. And in fact, key moments of Melanie's abduction and murder were left on tape for police to track. There were things that were placed in front of us that we never thought we would see. Things were just falling in line. God was with me on this one. The police had Ernesto Reyes on videotape at 2 in the morning, stalking and following Melanie at the convenience store. They also found tapes of Reyes an hour later, attempting to buy gasoline at a closed Chevron station. He can be seen noticing something on his shirt. The prosecutor says it's blood. So he takes it off, turning his shirt inside out to hide the stain. And then another tape, moments later, Ernesto Reyes is seen again at a nearby 7-Eleven, where he successfully buys a dollar and 76 cents of gasoline, casually filling up his can outside while asking a stranger to borrow his cell phone. He used the phone, told me, God bless you, you know, have a good evening, and he calmly walked away, as nonchalant as can be. Cold-blooded. Cold-blooded. All right. And finally, the videotape that shows Reyes dragging Melanie's body to be burned. All this evidence seemed overwhelming. But when it came to trial, a year and a half after Melanie Goodwin was brutally murdered, Ernesto Reyes' defense attorneys were quick to point out there were 90 key minutes not recorded. Between the time Ernesto followed her out of the store and when he is shown blowing her up, when perhaps those angels who were watching over Melanie blinked. There were no eyewitnesses. There was no confession. Uh, there was this hour and a half in time where we don't know what happened. Veteran Dallas lawyers Danny Clancy and Brett Martin knew they had a difficult task in creating reasonable doubt for the jury. These horrific photographs that we've seen, the video that we've seen, yes, it's evidence, but ultimately you have to make a decision whether or not the state's proven beyond a reasonable doubt that this man and no other is responsible for her death. And those 90 minutes that were not on tape gave Ernesto Reyes just enough room to tell his version of what happened to Melanie to a Spanish language television network. No, I'm not a killer. 
I ne I'm never, I've, I've never been a killer. I've never wanted to be a killer. I was just there at the wrong place, hanging with the wrong people. This is the man Ernesto Reyes accuses of being the wrong people. Mr. Young, you're currently under indictment for the felony offense of tampering with physical evidence. His name is Donovan Young. He admits that Ernesto showed up at his apartment about 3 a.m. the night Melanie Goodwin was murdered, took him down to the parking lot, and showed him her body in the back seat of her red Saturn. This is a two-door car, so they got like the little triangle window. I looked through there, and that's when I seen her in the back seat. Do you remember anything about her, her undergarments, her underwear? I remember she had a skirt on. Um, I'm not sure what top or anything like that. I think her underwear were slightly pulled down. <clears throat> and were you able to, to see anything about her face? I seen her eyes were open. When I looked in the back seat, he said he killed someone that looked like a dead person. Donovan Young, a convicted drug user with a shady reputation and Ernesto's friend, was a man in serious need of a moral compass because not only did Young not call police that night, he helped Reyes get rid of Melanie's body. He said he needed some gas, uh, said he needed a few dollars. I said, you know, I don't have any, but I, I, got, I do have a few dollars. And with that, Young says he gave Reyes money and a gas can and then walked back into his apartment and went to sleep. Why in the world did you not walk inside, pick up the phone, and call the police? Uh, I still, you know, I still think about that to this day. You know, I wish, I actually wish I could go back in time and do that because that's something I do regret. Donovan Young's cold-hearted response you know, left a huge opening for Reyes and his attorneys. You know, and Reyes saw this unsympathetic character as his way out. He told his story to a Spanish language television network. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I am innocent. I am innocent. And the person who did it is outside laughing about me. Fearing a blistering cross examination, Ernesto's attorneys did not allow him to testify in front of the jury. Instead, they played the TV interview in court to let Ernesto tell his tale without a prosecutor to challenge him directly. I asked for a ride. And she said to me, where are you going? And I told her, to my friend's house. And she said, yes. Reyes does not deny that's him on videotape stalking Melanie at the convenience store. But then he tells the interviewer Melanie is to blame, saying she was asking for trouble. She said to me, do you know where I could find some drugs? I asked what kind. And she said, whatever I can get. In the interview played out in court, Reyes then claims he had her drive to Donovan Young's apartment, where he got in the back seat while Melanie and Donovan sat in the front seat sharing marijuana and pills. Then I don't know what happened, the fight. I didn't know if he was hitting her or messing with her. Then I started getting scared. You could see that she was not okay. And then I asked, what happened? And then when I said, I'm going to leave, this guy pulled a gun on me, a black pistol. I'm not guilty. This guy's the one who killed her. It was very difficult for me to sit there and, and to listen to that. I always had the confidence that as the trial unfolded, that they would see the kind of Melanie that everybody that met Melanie saw. For them to imply that she would just go in and pick up somebody, it's so absurd and it hurts so bad that they would even have the nerve to imply that about my daughter. The anger I had was like a mother bear with her claws out. And it took a lot to calm me down. Um, after that day, I was shivering. I was so angry because Melanie just would never do that. None of my kids would. The pain and anger the Goodwins felt would not end soon. In that TV interview, Ernesto Reyes admits disposing of Melanie's body. After all, he was seen on videotape carrying her corpse and then setting it on fire. But the jury hears him claim that Donovan Young forced him to do the dirty work. I said, God, God help me. What am I going to do? Maybe he's going to kill me. So I bought the gasoline. And we went to the white warehouse. And then he said to me, put the gasoline on her. I said to him, no. And he told me laughing, laughing, you do it, you do it. So I did it. 
and buried in that TV interview is perhaps the only eyewitness, minute by minute account of how Melanie was killed. How did he kill her? Hitting her, just hitting her. I believe choking her. It was when I was high on drugs, he was holding her, grabbing her. When we return, whose story would the jury believe? Ernesto Reyes or Donovan Young? We'll be right back. Beautiful and charismatic college student Melanie Goodwin has been killed. And one man, Ernesto Reyes, is on trial for her murder. But does the prosecution have enough to convict Reyes? They're about to reveal one more piece of evidence. Once again, Jim Avila. Snapshots of a 19-year-old student actress. The last looks at Melanie Goodwin taken from her own digital camera, the one she carried in her car till the day she died. The pictures told the story of this young girl's life. You had her with her parents on vacation, you had her hugging her father, you had her with her boyfriend, and just being fun and silly, you know, just told the whole story of Melanie. One simple photo data card and two last snapshots that would shock the police self-portraits of Ernesto Reyes. He takes his own picture with Melanie's camera, and how would you explain that you're not involved if you're on four pieces of video? It's hard to refute what you see. And on that quick trip, what you hear. Ernesto Reyes' far-fetched story of a drug-craving young woman, anxious for sex with a stranger, killed by his drugged-out friend while he watched, is badly damaged by the fact that everywhere the jury turns is another photo of Ernesto Reyes. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Co-prosecutor Stephanie Fargo drove it home in her closing argument. Who has the evidence all over them? Who's the only person you see on the surveillance videos? You should be insulted that he tries to put this on Donovan Young. Evidence doesn't lie. In fact, the jurors say it was what they did not see in that explosion video that made them doubt Ernesto's alibi that an accomplice named Donovan Young killed her and ordered his cooperation. Juror Amy McCall. When Ernesto said that Donovan Young was in the back seat of the car with a gun telling him what to do at one point. And when the sky lights up, you can see inside that car and there was no one there. But perhaps the biggest hole in the Reyes story came from Melanie herself, a single trace of DNA. Most of the crime scene evidence was destroyed, but one critical piece of genetic material tying Ernesto Reyes to the attack on Melanie did not burn. The medical examiner found it deep inside her body. Swabs are placed both in the oral cavity, the vaginal cavity, then placed in a box, all of which is sealed and taken to the uh, criminal investigation laboratory. The DNA evidence that we were able to get was from the vaginal smear. We were not able to get DNA from her clothes or from her hands. He thought he was smart. He thought he was doing everything that he could do to get away with this crime. He thought by burning her body that he was burning up all the forensic evidence, any kind of DNA or blood evidence or his fingerprints. You know, He thought he was very successful at that. Well, he wasn't. The fire had done a pretty good job, but it did not get that DNA. So it showed that he had at least had sex with her. I had to prove that it was not consensual sex. Despite Melanie's all-American girl reputation, the defense team makes one last-ditch effort to blame the victim. They would try to convince the jury that she wanted to have sex with Reyes. You personally didn't observe any obvious signs of sexual assault, did you? Well, right. My autopsy clearly uh, lists that I didn't find lacerations or bruising in there. Again, that's not a big surprise, but uh, I did not see traumatic injuries. A lot of times you do find DNA underneath the fingernails of the victim where they're scratching and scraping and clawing and doing everything they can to fend off their attacker. None of that evidence existed. It was important for me to paint a very good picture of her because of the defenses that he was throwing out there and to be able to show that everything he said about her 
willingly, you know, getting in the back seat of her car is complete and utter nonsense. Not her, maybe somebody, not Melanie Goodwin. To paint that picture, the prosecution called Melanie's mother, Peggy Goodwin. If you were to, to hear, Mrs. Goodwin, that, that your daughter picked a stranger up at a convenience store at 1.30 at night and asked him to smoke some marijuana with her and then hopped in the back seat of her car with this stranger to have sex, would that in any way conform to the, the character or the identity of the girl that was your daughter? Absolutely not. We had gone over multiple times never pick up strangers and if you have to stop at night you have to stop at a very brightly lit well travel store lock your doors look behind you look around you be aware There's some video that they and then melanie's mother told an anecdote that helped the jurors understand why there were no signs of a struggle when she started asking me about melanie i just talked about her size that she was so tiny that when her brother would wrestle with her and tickle her, he would hold both of her wrists in one hand. And I thought to myself, my goodness, you know, she's, she has just un unwittingly explained to the jury exactly what happened, you know, that he was able to take hold of both her wrists and attack her that way. And that she didn't have the opportunity to scratch anybody's eyes out. That's why she didn't have DNA under her fingernails. He held both of her wrists in his hand while he beat her. But perhaps just as convincing to the jury was that the medical examiner confirmed there were no drugs of any kind in Melanie's system. And there was one other huge factor. Melanie was in a happy relationship with a boy she had promised to marry. They tried to raise that she somehow had consensual sex with this guy. I know no one in their right mind believes that, even people that didn't know her. And even though that's what he claimed, it's not even an option. Juror Anna Palmer never met Melanie. She didn't have to. Could you picture them in any way together? No, absolutely not. We saw her boyfriend, and I think she had a committed relationship with him. And I couldn't imagine her having anything to do with Ernesto Reyes. In order for you to believe it, you got to buy that. And then damning words from Deputy District Attorney Andrea Hanley, describing the terrible way Melanie died, raped, beaten, and killed by the hands of a stranger. The reality of being asphyxiated, of being strangled to death, is horrific. You must have enough pressure applied to a person's neck to cut off their blood flow and their oxygen for 10 to 15 seconds. That's 10 to 15 seconds of Melanie Goodwin struggling, most likely screaming, fighting for her life. That's 10 to 15 seconds that this defendant has his hands on that little girl's neck. The Reyes defense team called no witnesses, unwilling to let the defendant face cross-examination. He never told you that... But they made every attempt to raise reasonable doubt while questioning the prosecution's witnesses. We're asking you respectfully to return a verdict of not guilty in this case because the circumstantial evidence in this case does not rise to a level of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The jury took just three hours to reach a verdict. The defendant will please rise. What say you? We, the jury, find beyond a reasonable doubt the defendant, Ernesto Pena Reyes, guilty of the offense of capital murder as charged in the indictment. And then a final dramatic courtroom moment for Glenn and Peggy Goodwin. Before sentencing, they stood in front of the judge and emotionally told him of their loss. Melanie Therese Goodwin's family and friends have something to say to you. Look up at the video, Mr. Reyes. She then showed the judge a videotape of the daughter she lost. Knock, knock. Who's there? Interrupting cow. <laughs> Interrupting no. No. You demanded that he look at you that mm -hmm. you get a chance to look into those cold, evil eyes. Why? 
because he was going to hear what he did and he was going to look me in the eye and he was going to feel it and he was going to look at her video because he needed to know who Melanie was and what he did and how worthless he was. Did it work? Did he look up? Mm -hmm. He looked at the video and he looked at me and then he started crying. When we come back, Peggy Goodwin offers a surprising gesture. I guess my heart just reached out to her as a woman who had realized her son was this monster. Stay with us. Ernesto Reyes has been found guilty for the murder of college student Melanie Goodwin. Now it's time to start the healing process. With the conclusion of our story, Jim Avila. Merciful Father, Melanie's friends said goodbye to her on campus, celebrating with songs and pictures, a tribute not only to her life, but to her parents who had lost so much. She's just in your mind 24 seven. You won't always think about the good things and, and, and I do, but it saddens you nonetheless. I pray about her every day and it'll bring a tear to my eye. Bye, I love you. You grieve not only the loss of her, but the loss of your whole future. And we are trying to make good things happen, trying not to let the evil of this destroy us or our children. In fact, it was on the last day of the trial that the Goodwins' triumph over evil was on dramatic display. Reaching out to their killer's family, Two mothers who lost two very different children in a surprising embrace. He found in your heart some way to connect with his mother. I noticed when they showed the fire video that she was crying in the distance, and I thought she finally realized she's been lying to her. She sees the evidence and she knows. So I guess my heart just reached out to her as a woman who had realized her son was this monster. <laughs> I'm sorry. And so we just walked over to him and we just hugged each other and she kept saying she was sorry. And then Glenn spoke to her in Spanish. <laughs> and I was just thanking her for feeling sorry for us. And then I told her that, you know, I was sorry for her situation as well. Even hardened police veterans like Detective Greg Frade were moved by the grace of this rare scene. It was a very touching moment and another sign of how good the Goodwins are. They were named well. Goodwin is a good name for that family. They are very good people. Ernesto Reyes was sentenced to life in prison, but has never taken responsibility for Melanie's murder. Donovan Young was sentenced to eight years for tampering with evidence and young Ollie Valencia remains a friend of the family. It's still hers, and no matter what people tell me, I guess only time could heal. If ever, she was so precious, and it's not a job to take her, it's an honor. The fact that I was her boyfriend, to protect her, and then just to have her taken away, you feel guilty because you weren't there. I wasn't able to do my job. We will never and Melanie Goodwin's family started a scholarship fund for young actors in their daughter's name, hoping to keep her memory alive. 